Greetings. Welcome back to Prophetic Forecast. We've got lots of study. We're going to take a look at things from May. We're going to look forward to something that's coming up in June. And uh, then we're going to discuss uh, something coming up later this year as well. Before we get any, though, uh, any further into this uh, episode, though, I want to uh, let you know that this is the very last uh, episode of Prophetic Forecast on this per- uh, specific channel. We're going to be moving uh, this series and a few other series over to another channel on YouTube. So if you pause this video, you go down to the descriptions below, you will see a, uh, a link to Golden Thread Ministries. I've said many times, I'm a big believer that that Jesus is the golden thread of truth from Genesis to Revelation. All throughout Genesis to Revelation, there is a a powerful message of truth. Things don't change here or there. What is true in Genesis is true in Malachi, it's true in Matthew, and it's true in Revelation. And so I thought that would be a very fitting uh, name for uh, this new YouTube channel. So... Uh, You can pause now, and I I might remind you at the end, but you can click that link, subscribe to that channel, and then the very next prophetic forecast after this one will uh, come up on that channel, Golden Thread Ministries. Okay, hopefully you've paused it. Welcome back. Uh, We're going to continue on. We have several items to to cover, and uh, May was full of so many things. In fact, I'll I'll give you a a small rundown of some of the things later that that I had to skip just because there's too much information. First, I want to begin in the natural world. Nature is quickly turning on us as we turn on nature. Uh, Nature was not very kind this month. Uh, This month on May 22nd, Uh, There was an ultra marathon in China, which suddenly and unexpectedly turned deadly. It was a 62 mile race in, uh, in, in, well, (laughs) I'm I'm in Bishop, so it says high elevation, but uh, I think the city of Bishop, which is in a valley, is actually higher than than this ultra marathon. It was only about 3,000 feet, which uh, in that province at least is high elevation. But it was a high elevation race uh, with over 170 runners that participated. Uh, You can see from this picture that they dressed very lightly. They weren't expecting bad weather. Shorts, t-shirts, light jackets, and then suddenly, uh, what I've read, unexpectedly, just out of nowhere, freezing winds, rain and hell struck and, uh, and severely injured many people Many people were able to turn around fast enough to get out of the weather, but sadly and tragically, 22 people died uh, up there on the mountains. Uh, race officials uh, were blamed, uh, you know, and I don't really know if, if you could fairly blame them. Uh, maybe you can. Uh, uh, yeah, the weather came out of nowhere, but apparently there was no contingency plan. What if weather came up? What if an avalanche came up? What if an earthquake came up? What if something happened? How do we get news to the racers, uh, to the runners, and how do we get them off the mountain? So I guess there was some blame for that. But again, just sudden. Nature just suddenly turned on them. There was another notable and sudden attack of nature um, that actually took place in late April, just around the time that we released uh, the last uh, episode, but the findings of it actually took place in May. Uh, At the end of April, uh, an Indonesian submarine was lost at sea. The uh, And I don't know exactly how to pronounce this, so I hope I'm doing right, but the Nangala 402 lost all 53 of its crew in the Bali Strait. Uh, now, uh, again, this, this, uh, the, it took place in April, but they found the submarine in May. And the, uh, the, the findings of what took place also came out in May, apparently. Uh, and, and this is way over my head. So I'm going to do a, a, my best to kind of describe it in a, a, a little bit. Um, but I do have some uh, description in the description below. I do have a, a really interesting article actually about how these things work. But apparently an internal solitary wave hit the submarine, uh, ripped it lower uh, into, the, um, into the sea, into the ocean, uh, so deep that it ripped the submarine in half. 
So it kind of works like this. Here, here's, here it is kind of uh, dumbed down because that's as best as I can do. Um, but an internal solitary wave is, is something that you've actually likely experienced several times in your life if you've ever flown. Uh, when we're in the air, we call it turbulence. When two currents of water or air, depending if you're in the ocean or, or in the air, when two currents of water are kind of hitting into each other, and this, is, this happens a lot in straits because you've got two bodies of water. You've got the Pacific Ocean and, uh, well, in straits, you've got two bodies of water from anywhere, but in this particular strait, you've got the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean kind of meeting and converging there. And so it's known as, uh, as a turbulent area. But with all the other submarines and boats that have gone through there, nothing like this has ever taken place. They can be pretty violent at times. I mean, same with air turbulence. You may have seen the recent viral video uh, that was going around the internet of turbulence on a plane that sent a steward, I mean, slamming into the ceiling of, of, of the airplane and then slamming down and, and uh, the drink cart go flying and drinks and, and, and peanuts and things go all over uh, some, several of the passengers. And so turbulence happens, um, but, but in this strait, while, while it's known as to be turbulent, um, there was no fear. Many submarines and boats and things had gone through there, but this internal solitary wave was so strong uh, that it just, uh, and I don't know what any of this means, but for those of you who do, there's some uh, statistics for you, some graphs for you about just that pulling power that they can have uh, on, on a submarine under the water. And to have one just rip one, uh, rip, a, uh, rip a submarine in half is just um, unheard of, really, as, as far as I know. I mean, as much as I read and others were, were saying in the news reports that it's just uh, unheard of that something to be, for something to be that strong to do that. Nature wasn't done, apparently, isn't done. This is a news story that goes back a few years, but uh, the, release, the findings are released here in May. Uh, several children in Malaysia were underdiagnosed in 2018. Here's what I mean. They had been diagnosed with pneumonia and they likely had pneumonia, but it didn't just, it wasn't just pneumonia. What they actually had was canine COVID. And I picked a picture of a pug because I have a pug, but also because the, uh, the first reported case last year of a canine COVID in the United States actually was a pug. Uh, now this, this actual strain of canine coronavirus uh, is, un well, it, it's somewhat related to COVID-19, but it's a different variant, not even, I shouldn't say variant, it's a different strand. And so it's one that's been around. Dogs have had coronavirus for a while uh, in different ways, but for a human to get it, that's unheard of. Uh, that process is called zootonic, zoo, like a you know, place of animals, zoo, zoology, zoo, I'm sorry, zoonotic, zoonotic, not zootonic. That might be a drink you get at a zoo, uh, but zoonotic. Um, and that means when a disease is passed from an animal to a human. So what Duke University did during the time of uh, COVID-19 was they started to look back at uh, samples uh, that were, you know, processed in labs and, and on record. So I started to look back to see if it, when this, has, uh, when COVID-19 really struck uh, the world and where it may have come from. And they were surprised. They went all the way back to 2018 and they ended up, well, probably even later, but they found that unknown to the Malaysian doctors at the time, when, uh, when this blood was tested, it actually tested positive for canine covid uh, you know, bird flu, swine flu, you know, we've heard of zoonotic things before, but this is the first proof ever of a strand of a coronavirus. So it's not COVID-19, it's a different strand, but the first proof of a coronavirus strand being zoonotic, uh, opening up more possibilities of where COVID-19 came from. And of course, in the news today, uh, and I don't have this in my notes because it was just happening uh, at the last minute here before while I was typing up and getting ready. 
Uh, but uh, President Biden and the Pentagon are uh, admitting that they're digging in deeper now to discover more about the origins of COVID-19. Allegedly, apparently there's some proof. I know last year, a lot of people said it's come from labs in China. And, and uh, that side of our government said, no, 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 that, that's racist, that's racist, that's racist. Well, uh, they're now coming, I'm, I'm, I'm staying out of it, but they're now coming along and saying, well, uh, you know, maybe it did. Actually, there's some proof that it did come from a lab uh, in, in China. And then, of course, where else did it come from? Did it come from eating bats and all things will now be uh, uh, dived into, uh, dove into more over the next uh, coming months. So we'll have to follow up. But at least now in May, Duke University released these findings that, yeah, a different form of it, but still coronavirus, but a different strand uh, called canine covid did pass to humans in 2018. Uh, also on May 22nd, the same day as the, uh, the race in, uh, in China, I didn't even realize that until I just read it. Uh, uh, I didn't realize it as I typed it. But on May 22nd, a massive volcanic explosion took place in the Congo and dozens have been killed. They're still uh, finding bodies. Uh, at least 500 homes were destroyed and many, many reports of missing family members. Nature, like I told you, nature turned on us this month for sure. Nature has never exactly been our friend. Uh, it, uh, you know, in, in the sinful world, sin reigns everywhere. Uh, and, and, it's, and nature's, you know, constantly been uh, a lover and a hater, right? Lover and a fighter. But, uh, but this month in particular, it was pretty hard on us. Something else in nature uh, this month that I want to discuss, but it isn't exactly natural. Thousands, and I, I'll repeat, thousands of genetically modified mosquitoes were released in the Florida Keys this past month uh, as a way to slow the population growth of mosquitoes. The, uh, the thousands of mosquitoes uh, were all made male. So that's how they were genetically modified. They were all male and they were pumped out into, into the local area there uh, in the uh, Florida Keys. Um, and so because they're all males, they will procreate with the female mosquitoes, uh, but they will also only produce male mosquitoes. So it's not just that we, you know, uh, somehow genetically modified only some males or that we, you know, captured a bunch of uh, mosquitoes and killed all the females and kept the males. But we actually genetically modified how they procreate, you know, this amalgamation of science and nature. Uh, it's dangerous world uh, ground to be walking on, as we've learned in previous episodes. So they're only going to produce male mosquitoes. Well, when you have an overabundance of male mosquitoes and just a few female mosquitoes, obviously uh, those female mosquitoes can only procreate so much. And so you're going to slow the population growth of mosquitoes. This is no, nothing new in the world of recent. Uh, Brazil, India, Panama have, have tried this and uh, apparently it's working. Uh, but this is the first in the United States. Uh, my point is, we are messing with nature, and nature isn't very happy with it. I, I wouldn't personally want to get into that world of, of messing with how a species, uh, even if it's mosquitoes, because where do you stop, right? Where do you stop? It's mosquitoes, and then it's, you know, other animals, and then it's humans, and it's, it's scary stuff, especially when we remember what we learned last time or a couple times ago. Um, that was the chief sin of Noah's day was this amalgamation of science and nature and, and what they did uh, to, to uh, scar the, the image of God. We're messing with things that are supposed to be natural. I don't like mosquitoes either. Trust me. Um, and, you know, it's not just an annoyance. You know, they're hoping to, to slow the, the, the passing of uh, uh, Zika and uh, West Nile virus and things, malaria. Um, and so, I mean, there's purpose to it, but just because there's purpose to it, it, it's a little dangerous to be getting into that, that kind of stuff, especially when we think about where do we then stop with this science. All right, a mystery that had been in the news about five years ago has resurfaced. You may remember in 2016, 
when 130, 130, 130 members of the U.S. Embassy in Havana, Cuba, were struck suddenly with brain injuries and several symptoms uh, that has become known as Havana Syndrome. Symptoms like ear popping, vertigo, sudden headaches, nausea, dizziness, etc. Just, you know, somewhat suddenly came uh, throughout this building. 130. Uh, 130 different people suddenly got sick. Now, most of these personnel, five years later, still haven't fully recovered. Uh, they now have traumatic brain injuries. Many of them are getting occupational therapy, uh, you know, emotional therapy, psychiatric therapy because of what's taken place. It's believed that it was some sort of energy weapon uh, that, uh, you know, shot at the building and made these 130 people sick. So it's believed that it was a terrorist attack. Uh, now, what you may not know, and I didn't know until it was released here in May of 2021, uh, that this didn't only happen there. It didn't only happen in Havana at the U.S. Embassy. That's why we call it Havana Syndrome. But it happened in other places as well. Two years later, in fact, a year and a half later, in fact, in April of 2018, several embassy personnel had to be transported back to the U.S. from China uh, for treatments because they also came down with what is called Havana Syndrome. Then again, in 2020, last year, uh, it happened several different times around Washington, D.C. This time, unlike the other ones, it didn't happen in a building to several people. It was, um, it was more focused. It happened outside in public, um, but and it hit an individual several different times around Washington, D.C. In fact, one of them was a square just near the, the White House, but it was focused and concentrated at individuals rather than a group of people. Uh, and, and all the people who were targeted in Washington, D.C. in 2020 were U.S. personnel, still government personnel, uh, employees. They weren't high ranking or, or, you know, like the president or anything that we know of, but, uh, but they, were, they were employees of the government who were targeted. Uh, one lady was just simply walking her dog. I think, I, in fact, I think she was the lady in the square outside the White House who was walking her dog when the symptoms suddenly come, came on. Uh, what all these reports are saying is that they're hearing 20 to 30 seconds of a strange humming noise followed by immediate symptoms. So you're, you, know, you kind of hear that noise, and you're like, ah, and then as soon as it turns off, you're sick with uh, what is, again, what is being called Havana syndrome. And apparently it's not only Americans either. Uh, in 2019, uh, a Pittsburgh neurologist ran some tests on, uh, on Canadian diplomats and what they were going through was Havana syndrome. So it seems that somebody in this uh, terrorist attack was targeting diplomats in the United States, but from Canada. A lot of these reports now are coming out and being more discussed here in May of 2021. Also what came out in May of 2021 on this subject is that US intelligence agencies have now formally admitted that these things are taking place and that there is an intense, and that's, this is a quote, an intense investigation uh, into these matters. And then an unnamed source uh, from the Pentagon um, said that it is believed by uh, the intelligence agencies in our, in our nation that it's a Russian spy agency uh, who is the culprit behind it. Is it? I got no clue. But the fact that these uh, targeted terrorist attacks are happening uh, isn't just, you know, limited to the one thing in 2016. It's been happening uh, t since, since then as well. And those are just the ones that we've been notified of. So uh, keep that in mind. You know, it just reminds us life is fragile, really fragile. We have no idea with all the things going on in this world, uh, you know, more and more public shootings are taking place. Another one today in San Jose, eight people killed in an office building. More and more, we need to be ready, be ready, be ready every day to be crucified daily, right? To, to have our life in the hands of Jesus, to submit our lives, humble our lives into his hands, and to trust that whether good things or bad things, trial, tribulation, or blessing, whether life or death takes place, that our lives are hidden, uh, both now and for eternity, in Jesus Christ. 
Okay, now this next topic will likely get me a warning from a, a warning label from YouTube, but it's an important topic to discuss anyway. I want to discuss uh, the, the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, before you judge what I'm about to say, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I realize that some of our viewers have very strong opinions for the vaccine. And another group of viewers have a very strong uh, opinion against the vaccine. I'm not going into that world. I'm not going to discuss uh, whether you should be for or against it. Um, but I want us to focus specifically on the desire to use the COVID vaccine by the world to promote world unity. Uh, it's certainly take, uh, worth taking note of. Not, it's not just simply, um, hey, if we're all in this together, sometimes it's being promoted as, hey, we're all in this together. But there's a lot more to it when you really look at what the world is saying about this vaccine. So as we go through this, I'm not saying don't get it. I'm not saying do get it. I'm saying let's take a look at how the world is using the vaccine um, not and the, and all all quotes here. They're not just using it for the promotion of physical health or safety from COVID, but more than that, more than that. So that's where I'm going to focus our discussion because it's fulfillment of Revelation 13. Not the way that people think. It's not the mark of the beast. I have zero reason to believe it's the mark of the beast. I know what the mark of the beast is. It is the coming national and then universal Sunday law. It is not this COVID vaccine. However, the way people are talking about it, the way they are promoting it, um, we see, uh, in, we see, we see uh, a foreshadowing of how they'll discuss the coming Sunday law. Okay, so what I want to discuss, because it took place in May, is uh, the Vax Live, V-A-X, Vax is short for vaccine, the Vax Live event hosted by an organization called Global Citizen. Uh, now, what is Global Citizen? Here's from their actual website. Uh, there is a link down below to their website, so you can read this yourself. It says this, Global Citizen is a movement of engaged citizens who are using their collective voice to end extreme poverty by 20. 30. So no, notice, their goal is to end extreme poverty, and they've taken up this, uh, this, this stance of everyone needs to be vaccinated. Okay, let's keep reading. Nothing evil about that. Let's keep reading. On our platform, Global Citizens, this one world unit, united group, the Global Citizens learn about the systemic causes of extreme poverty take action on those issues, and earn rewards for their actions. Now, this, this isn't the Vax Live event per se. This is Global Citizen who is hosting and promoting this event called Vax Live. So they're saying, hey, we're a movement that wants to end uh, poverty. By the way, I want to be a part of a movement that ends poverty. I want poverty gone. I don't want there to be the, the wealthy and the, and, and the poor. I don't want that. I don't want that at all. That's not my issue here. Uh, and so notice how they hope to do it. That people who sign up and become a global citizen will one, learn from them about systemic poverty, two, take action on those issues, uh, and then three, if you take action uh, on those, on, on, on the things that they're learning or the things that you're learning or the things that they're teaching you, then you are rewarded by taking action. Okay, let's keep reading. What are the rewards? Let's keep reading. Also from their website, Global Citizen Rewards is our way of thanking our community for taking action to solve the world's biggest challenges. We reward our community with the chance to win uh, tickets to concerts and sporting events, gift cards, subscriptions, merchandise, VIP experiences, and more. Okay. 
Oh boy. <laughs> to help end poverty, they assign you tasks to do. I looked into it. The tasks are like signing petitions, posting uh, uh, about them, about global citizens or about these issues on social media, retweeting some of the things they tweeted about, um, sh sharing things that they have uh, posted about on Facebook, uh, holding uh, community groups, learning sessions, discussions, dialogue in your communities. If you uh, learn from them, and then you go out and do the tasks that they assign you, then once completed, you are given points. And the points can be redeemed in a lottery for goods and events. So basically, this organization that wants to end poverty, to stop the abuse of currency, has created a new form of currency, points. I want you to do this, and if you do it, I'll give you points, and you can take those points and redeem them for these awesome things. Just like a boss who says, here's your job for the day. If you do the job, I'll pay you your salary, and then you can take your money and spend it on whatever you'd like. A form of currency, by the way, here, that favors those with internet access. So let's end poverty by earning points to these awesome things and learn about people who don't have access to the internet. Uh, and then you can prosper by talking about them. Uh, and, and then you can exchange your points for cool stuff. Solomon said, this world is full of vanity, emptiness. They have no answers. The world has no answers for these, for these problems. I agree poverty is an issue. I agree that there's a massive problem, many, many massive challenges in our world. And the world is so desperate to deny Jesus, so desperate, so incredibly desperate to not use the only solution we have, Jesus Christ that in order to end currency and poverty, they're gonna create a system of points, currency, that helps people more who have internet access. They're spinning circles. The world is spinning circles. The world is wasting its time thinking it can fix itself. The spirit of antichrist, salvation by works. It wastes time, it wastes time. Salvation from sin, salvation from the world's challenges, comes only by Jesus Christ. Okay, this organization who is spinning its circles put on this large event promoting the right of people around the world to receive the COVID vaccine. Um, this event was called Vax Live. Now this is their logo. I know it says Vax because, but it's called Vax Live, a concert to reunite the world. You know, we had a whole conversation about this word re a couple months ago, re, 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 like let's do it again. And it's interesting, a concert to reunite the world. When was the world united in the first place? The last time we can look back, and I mentioned this last time when we talked about this re, uh, and I think we were talking about the rebuild, movement, uh, rebuild together movement, and you look through its language, it's all about re this, re that, re, 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 let's do it again. Last time the world was united was the Tower of Babel. So, well, I don't want to go back to there. I have no problem with uniting the world. But let's not reunite the world. The last time the world, the citizens of the world did it was at the Tower of Babel and they got it wrong. I don't want to relive those steps again. I don't want to promote Babylon. Anyway, uh, a concert to reunite the world. Several celebrities performed and spoke during the event, including Meghan Markle, Jennifer Lopez, Chelsea Clinton. Meghan Markle, in fact, used this uh, Vax Live event to announce that she was having a, a daughter. Uh, her and uh, William were having a daughter. So it was, you know, a pretty big event. Uh, Meghan focused on the need for the vaccine so that her soon-to-be-born daughter could come into a healthier world. Chelsea Clinton focused on an, the needed crackdown uh, on anti-vax social media posts. 
But what really drew my attention was on the webpage. Now, there's the Global Citizen webpage, link the bo below if you want to see that, but also the Vax Live website, and I have this link below as well, at the Vax Live website, uh, of all the people in the world that I could interview, interviewed one person, not of all these people, but of one person, and put that interview on its page called, How Does the Pope Feel About COVID-19 Vaccines? Of all the people in the world they could have uh, focused on, they chose Pope Francis. Now, I know, that kind of makes sense. He's a huge figure in the world, so I'm sure they were excited that he would be interviewed and share his thoughts. Um, but he, he specifically actually shared a whole speech at the event, and the video of it was uploaded uh, for the Vax Live event, but also uploaded to the Global Citizens website. I have a link below if you wanna watch the whole speech, but I'll give you a few of its highlights. One thing he said was faced with so much darkness and uncertainty, light and hope are needed. The light and hope he's discussing is the COVID-19 vaccine. Now that's important because I want you to remember back last month, uh, I shared with you President Biden's Easter uh, address, uh, address to the nation, where both he and the first lady had a strong focus on light and darkness, quoting from the Bible, saying it themselves, you know, and they connected the COVID-19 vaccine to the light that can help us in our, in our darkness. So same language being used. You've got President Biden giving an Easter address and saying the vaccine is the light into the darkness. Now you have Pope Francis saying it is the light and hope that is needed in the darkness and uncertainty. Again, you haven't heard me say don't or do take the vaccine. I'm not talking about that. I don't talk about microchips and uh, DNA or RNA. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm just saying the language that they're using is all connected. Whether you're talking about the president of the United States or the Pope or others, it is connecting that this is what the world needs. This is what everyone needs. Please get it out. It is the light in the darkness. That is important. Pay attention to this language because the Pope and the president are connecting these things. Uh, I still, and I think I've said this enough, I don't believe that the vaccine is the mark of the beast, but the language that the beasts of Revelation 13, Rome, the first beast, the United States, the second beast, the language that they are using to describe the vaccine is the spirit of Antichrist. That this thing, whatever it is, this particular thought is about the vaccine, but whatever they say it is, they're saying this will fix the world. This will unite the world. This will bring us together. Right now, right here, right now, they're saying the vaccine, the vaccine, the vaccine. Soon, not much longer, I believe, but soon they'll be saying the Sunday law. The Sunday law is the light that we need in the darkness. He continues, now here's where, where we're going to get into the fact that he's not even using it to discuss COVID-19. He's talking about it as light and hope in the darkness, but notice he's not talking about the disease. He's talking about the vaccine, but not the disease. When he says darkness and uncertainty, he continues, and I mean a healing. By the way, some of you Bible students know the wound in Revelation 13 heals, okay? This is an important part of the language too. We need a healing, he's saying. And I mean a healing at the root, which heals the cause of evil and does not remain only in the symptoms. So he's not talking about the, co he's saying COVID is the symptom. The problems, the challenges in the world are the symptoms, but we need something that will heal at the root and the cause of evil. He's promoting a vaccine to do that. In these diseased roots, we find the virus of individualism. Not the virus of COVID. Again, I'm saying this isn't my thoughts. These are his thoughts, right? 
Um, I don't know. Maybe my, my video will be, will be banned or censored, but his isn't. He's the one saying this, right? Uh, we find the virus. He's not talking about the virus of COVID. He's saying this vaccine can heal the roots of the virus of individualism. He continues, which does not make us freer or more equal or kinder. Individualism doesn't make us freer or equal or kinder, but rather makes us indifferent to the suffering of others. And a variant of this virus, a variant of individualism, not a variant of COVID, but a variant of this virus of individualism is closed nationalism. You know, by the way, I mean, uh, that's an attack at America's constitution, is it not? Doesn't America's constitution guarantee individualism? Doesn't it protect our nation and nationalism? It protects, you know, the Bill of Rights protects our freedoms of individualism. And he's saying, uh-uh, nothing can guard us or make us free or equal or kinder if it's individualized. We need to be global citizens. We need to come together. We need light in the darkness. He's not talking about COVID-19, but he's saying the vaccine will give us these things. It will attack individualism. It will attack closed nationalism. Notice the language. Now, again, let me be clear one last time here to those of you who feel strong for the use of the vaccine and especially the YouTube censor police. My discussion here is not the use of the vaccine. I'm not promoting people to use or not use. I'm promoting I'm discussing that the language of the beasts of Revelation 13, Rome and Washington, is promoting the vaccine because the vaccine will bring people together. It will reunite the world. It will end the evils of individualism and nationalism and poverty. He goes on talking about the economy. And again, there's a link down below where you can see the whole video if you'd like. But he goes on to you know talk about uh, the problems of, of, of the world, and his solution is the vaccine. With it, we'll have a light in the darkness, he says, and President Biden says. With it, we can heal the culture of the world. With it, uh, you know, we can do great and wonderful things. And, and a vaccine for a disease, he's not even talking about the disease. He's not talking about how get it out to everyone so we can save them from a disease, which is its intended purpose. He's saying get it out to the world so we can heal the wounds of our world. He says that it will heal the world of its cultural and social cancers. He talks about the environment. He talks about the economies. Uh, as we noticed, individualism and nationalism. Family, this is the exact same language that they will be using to bring about the coming Sunday law and the same language they'll be using when they take it a step further and uh, bring about a universal death decree to those who refuse to honor that law. The last thing I want to mention on the subject of Rome is, uh, is the stronger and stronger marveling after the beast that is taking place within the United States. Uh, on Mother's Day, CNN's website uh, honored a mother. It was Mother's Day. They honored a mother. And I happened to notice that of all the mothers in the world that they could honor and discuss, uh, they chose to honor the fourth tallest statue in the United States called Our Lady of the Rockies, uh, which is located in Butte, Montana. So yes, instead of honoring uh, the, one of their employees, Joe Biden, uh, Kamala Harris, any of the many celebrities that, you know, they constantly go on and on about on CNN, they honored an image to the beast. And you know what I mean? Mary's not the beast, but the power, the authority, the doctrines, the teachings, the deceptions of the beast. They chose on Mother's Day to honor an image to the beast. And I have that article down below as well.
Okay, we've got to we've got to uh, fast forward. We got, I got to speed up. I've had to cut out sadly a discussion of what's taking place between uh, Israel and Hamas. Uh, however, I will be discussing it in a sermon, and so I'll have a link uh, down below. The sermon is entitled "Israel and Its Neighbors," and so you can you can uh, go look at that if you want some. It won't be an in-depth uh, discussion of it, um, but you can sc- come see some of the discussion of what's happening between Israel and Hamas. Uh, I also had to cut out uh, a, dis- a discussion on the dark side hack and uh, how it re- reflects upon our economy and gas prices. I kind of I kind of cut out because I don't want to talk about gas prices. I'm too annoyed by them anyway. Um, but something else that took place here in in May, and then we'll, it'll move us to June, and then the future event. Another military video was uh, affirmed uh, and uh, uh, by the Pentagon this month of a UFO. Uh, that was uh, the video itself was taken in July of 2019 uh, by an unidentified Navy aircraft, but it was uploaded to the USS Omaha's Combat Information Center. So an aircraft took a video of a UFO, they uploaded it to a ship, and uh, at some point um, it was released to someone privately, who then made it public here in May of. 2020, I'm sorry, 2021, and then the Pentagon came out and said, yeah, that is a real video. In the clip, and I, I, I'm not going to show you the clip here, um, but guess what? In the description below, you've got a link to the clip. Uh, but in the clip, we see a UAP, UFO, same thing, hovering above the waters of the Pacific Ocean near, uh, near San Diego, and then it suddenly dips into the ocean. You can actually hear in the video uh, the Navy personnel who are watching say, oh my goodness, it just splashed, it splashed. And then it went and viewed it and it was gone. It went into the ocean. Uh, the Pentagon in May did come forward and admit the video is legit and was taken by Navy personnel. They also said that it is one of many videos that are under review. Also in May, retired Senator Harry Reid from Nevada spoke up yet again. He's been speaking a lot about UFOs lately. And he said here in May that he believes that Lockheed Martin has actual UFO fragments, metals, technology from another planet. Uh, Now, Lockheed Martin, for those who don't know, is a corporation who manufactures both aerospace and defensive products for our government. And Harry Reid said this following quote, about trying to get access to the Lockheed to what Lockheed Martin has. Uh, here's what he said. He was to, he, he says I was told for decades, not just a year or two or months, decades, that Lockheed had some of these retrieved materials, and I tried to get, as I recall, a classified approval by the Pentagon to have me go look at the stuff. Uh, now I, I want you to remember before we get to the rest of his quote. He was actually a part of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So, so him asking for classified approval is normal, it's rational, it's logical, and really should have been approved. He knows all kinds of intelligence that the world doesn't know, that the, the public doesn't know, that even other senators don't know except for the ones on this committee. So he says, I just want to go look at this stuff as a part of the Intelligence Committee. Keep reading. They would not approve that. I don't know what all the numbers were, what kind of classification it was, but they would not give that to me. So here was a senator, a Democratic majority uh, House, uh, sorry, Senate uh, leader of, of, of the Senate, uh, on an intelligence committee, and he's told, uh-uh, you don't get to go look at this. It is, it is so classified you can't go look. He wasn't told, we don't know what you're talking about. He wasn't told, no, uh, material from UFOs? No, uh, we don't know what you're talking about. He was told, no, you can't have the classified numbers or the classified approval to go look at it. Almost seems to verify that there was something, but who knows? Uh, uh, the government doesn't just, by the way, the Pentagon doesn't just block Harry Reid, a member of the Intelligence Committee. Uh, former President Barack Obama was on the James Corden late night show here in May, and uh, he was asked about, uh, you know, some of these things about UFOs and, and, uh, and what he knows as, uh, as a president, you know, could he share anything? And he says, uh, and I've got a link, by the way, of course, down below for, for you to watch the whole uh, interview if you'd like. 
Um, but he says that he asked around about the lab. You know, where's the lab where we hide all the UFO stuff? Uh, repeatedly, he says over the years, you know, eight years he was president. And every single time he was told, no. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't know about this stuff. So the Pentagon wasn't just hiding from Harry Reid, but even the commander in chief, their boss, they were saying, uh uh, you don't get to know about it. Uh, he ended up saying this, though, of things that happened during his presidency. So he couldn't know this stuff before being president, but he could be, he obviously knew of things that happened during his presidency. He said this when it comes to aliens, there are some things I can't tell you on air. Uh, there's a link below to the whole interview if you want to watch. Uh, you know, we've been chatting, talking, something, something's going on. They're getting ready. They're getting ready. In fact, we know that at the end of June, and here's June's event that we're going to discuss just briefly. At the end of June, now is the deadline. We've, I told you back, you know what, 150 days ago uh, in, in one of our episodes that uh, part of the stimulus plan was, uh, you know, voted that the intelligence committees have to bring out uh, some information, uh, uh, not some information, the information about what they know about UFOs and aliens and extraterrestrials and things. And that deadline here is at the end of June. Uh, what is known as the best and clearest picture of a UFO ever, uh, uh, apparently 100, 100 feet long, um, it's long been rumored about, long been talked about. It's, it's almost the myth, or, or I should say it's like this rumor, this, this legend that has grown. Um, but apparently, uh, it's real, and it's going to be a part, uh, at least we're being led to believe, that this picture is going to be released at the end of June. It's long been known as the clearest and best picture of a UFO ever taken. It was taken over the skies of Scotland. Uh, we don't even know when, but it was taken at some point. Uh, and so that picture is supposed to be released as part of this information. So stay tuned on that. Okay, I want to get to our last topic of the day. And I know this has been going long, but I hope you've been engaged and, and interested because there's a lot of really important information here. Uh, coming in October, so this is months from now, uh, you know, and I've talked a lot about uh, the importance of October before, prophetically, uh, and, and, in, and in the world, especially in the world of deceptions and things. So uh, no surprise here that it's October. But anyway, coming in October is the Catholic Identity Conference here in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a slide off of their website. This is the backdrop of their website. Uh, now, we've discussed uh, this, this side of Catholicism that is very focused on tradition, that uh, believes in the leadership of uh, Arch Archbishop uh, Vigano, this side of the church that believes that Rome is Babylon, that Rome is an heir, that the Pope, uh, the Pope is wicked, uh, that the United States is home to God's true church, and that the vaccine is the mark of the beast. Again, that's what that side of that church, that denomination believes. Uh, and I have a link to this website, but you're welcome to go on it and monitor it if you like over the next few months. But the, the, uh, the website itself is really bare. I mean, there's hardly anything on it. Um, but they do have a three-minute trailer um, that I'm actually going to show you here uh, right now. A three-minute trailer about what they hope to be promoting uh, in October at the Catholic Identity Conference. So go ahead and check out this trailer.
With the situation in Washington, D.C. now having gone from bad to worse, and the situation in the Vatican worse than ever, there has never been a more urgent time for Christians in America to unite the clans than right now. And come October, that's exactly what we're going to do. I hope to see you there. Okay, I have seven quick bullet points of things that I, I want to point out from this trailer, and then we'll wrap it all up, okay? Hang with me. Uh, number one, the traditional side of the church is accusing the other side of the church, Rome, of aligning themselves with Protestants, right? They, Rome, they've Protestantized his mass, God's mass. Meanwhile, this other side is aligning itself with right-wing Protestant uh, evangelicals here in the United States. So you've got this side, you know, aligning themselves with Protestants blaming the other side of aligning with Protestants. Both are true. Both sides are aligning with Protestants. This side with conservative Protestants, that side with liberal Protestants. And both sides are aligning themselves with the Protestant world. Like I've been saying all along, two wings, same bird. They're, they, they, it's almost a fake war. It's almost like a, a distraction from what's really going on. They're both doing it, but they're accusing each other of doing it. Uh, bullet point number two, it says there will be a remnant left. That, that in all these things that are taking place, uh, the attacks at the church and things, there will be a remnant left. And in the video, it was followed by a, a video of Vigano blessing the crowd, stating that he's the leader uh, or, or illustrating that he is one of the remnant and those who follow him are a part of this remnant. Now, they're obviously identifying themselves as the remnant who is left. That, that there will be a remnant left. They're saying, that's us. That's us. That's this conference. Uh, the, this, this vocabulary of the remnant who is left uh, is, is from the Old Testament discussing those who were still alive uh, and, and, and serving God after the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. So you have... Um, uh, also, by the way, the remnants is discussed in Revelation, and, uh, and it's listed as those who stand against the beast. So the remnant is left because they stand against the beast. They're saying they're the remnant. So who are they standing against? Rome. They're saying that we're the remnant and Rome is Babylon, right? Babylon's coming to destroy Jerusalem. We are uh, the remnant who is left. They're saying that the beast of Revelation 13 is Rome. So you've got this side saying, you're, you're Babylon, you're the beast, we are the remnant. The third quick bullet point, they go on and say, they discuss that they're here to save the Christian homeland. They've got a long list of things they're going to save, but one of them is the Christian homeland. Well, which, which land is that? Well, the next picture is, and I'm assuming that this is the first Thanksgiving or the meeting uh, in America between uh, Native Americans and, and, well, what is shown as Catholic, uh, uh, Catholic uh, Europeans coming to the New World. So they're saying the Christian homeland is no longer Rome, is not Jerusalem. They're saying it's the United States of America. And if, if you watched a, a previous series we did called Equal in the Sight of God, we discussed this in great detail that, uh, you know, this millennial idea, this thinking that Jesus was going to come here to the United States as the Christian homeland and establish his kingdom here in the United States. That's a Protestant belief. Um, and now the Catholic Church is promoting it. The traditional side is aligning themselves with the conservative traditional side of Protestantism with the same doctrines and saying the other side is wicked and bad and they're the ones aligning themselves with Protestants. One side of the church is promoting Rome. The other side is promoting the USA. Two wings, same bird. The two beasts of Revelation 13, Rome and the United States, are going to United. It's working. I mean, it's happening right here before our very eyes. In fact, uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. This is the backdrop, uh, number four, the fourth uh, quick uh, bullet point. This is the backdrop of their website, but it was also in the video, the trailer. And uh, uh, it, it flashes uh, right after the words flash 
Catholic identity. So the words, you know, and you can go back and watch trailer. It flashes uh, Catholic identity, but then it flashes this screen. So it's saying this is our identity. What is this? This is the Crusades, right? These are Crusaders. Crusaders did what? They went to Jerusalem to try to free it from what they believed to be Babylon, Islam. That's what they're saying this is. That the purpose of the Catholic Identity Conference is to remember our identity. We are crusaders. And we have to free Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the Christian homeland, the United States from Babylon. They're declaring war on Babylon. They're on the same side, but they're declaring war against one another. Fifth quick bullet point of, uh, oh, I only have six. Hey, I thought I had seven. Uh, the fifth one is October 1 to 3 are the dates. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, we've spoken quite a bit about the number 13 and Mary. And we've also discussed October and, uh, and uh, its importance to Mary. Most specifically, we've talked a lot about uh, the miracle of the sun at Fatima, which took place on October 13. And I know that's not October 13, but it's in October 1 to 3. Um, which, I, you know, I really believe it's purposeful uh, that, and of course, we, talk, we it saw in the trailer a lot about Mary, about Mary, about Mary constantly throughout, uh, throughout this trailer. And so there's a great deal of focus that Mary and Christ, there's a lot of focus on Christ too, but that Mary and Christ will free us, that they will help us, that they will bring us back to our identity. And just in case you think that, uh, that, uh, uh, that this, these dates, October 1 to 3, have nothing to do with Mary, I'll just remind you that behind the date, the announcement of the dates, they have a picture of Mary herself. So I think they even knew what they were doing here. Okay, you just saw it here because my finger clicked it, but the sixth one, last one, the official theme of the conference is Christianity under siege, right? Jerusalem under siege. We need to be crusaders. We need to go free it. Standing with Christ in the shadow of the cross. By the way, who was standing, who was standing in the shadow of the cross was John, the church, with Mary, right? But, side note, uh, but underneath the video itself, so this is the theme of the conference, Christianity under siege, standing with Christ in the shadow of the cross. Um, underneath the video itself, down in the description, actually is another theme, a motto. I guess you could call it. That's the theme. Here's the motto because they have a hashtag here and you'll see a uh, hashtag unite the clans. The purpose of this conference, Catholic identity conference, Catholic identity conference is to unite the clans. You may wonder what are the clans? Are those the two sides we've been talking about? The more liberal side, Rome? And, uh, and, and, and DC, you know, uh, American Catholics, are those the two clans? Well, uh, let's go back to the video real quick. Just notice what Michael Matt said. Hi, this is Michael Matt. With the situation in Washington, DC, now having gone from bad to worse, and a situation in the Vatican worse than ever, there's never been a more urgent time for Christians in America to unite the clans than right now. And come October, that's exactly what we're gonna do. I hope to see you there. He defines the clans. The clans are Christians, not Catholics, Christians in America. You know, all these sides may be at war, all these sides may be different, but their theme is let's end individualism. No longer should it be Catholics and Protestants and Catholics and Catholics. We want a Catholic identity, Catholic meaning universal. We want a universal identity conference to unite the clans. We will unite the clans by going to war. We're going to be crusaders. We're going to unite the clans. And the clans are identified by the host himself, Michael Matt, Christians in America. The two beasts of Revelation 13 have the same doctrines the same vocabulary, the same teachings, and even though they say they're worlds apart, they're on the same side. End individualism. End consciousness of belief. Let's work together. Let's end the clans. Let's, you know, save the world together. 
Okay, we are out of time. More on this conference later as we get closer, as they release more information. If you've enjoyed this video, please go down and like the video, share it on social media, share it by text, share it by email, and don't forget to go subscribe to our new channel, Golden Thread Ministries. There's a link down below for that, as I've told you. Uh, on our very next prophetic forecast, we will be on that channel if you want to come look for us. So I will see you at Golden Thread Ministries on YouTube next time. Until then, let's stay focused on Bible prophecy. Let's keep our eyes open to Jesus. And let's see what he has in store for you today. Thank you.